I recalled something that my sister and her family had said they live across country. And my, they all, they had COVID as well. And my sister said, you know, the first 48 hours were really the hardest for us. And I thought, well, if this is as bad as it gets, then I'm pretty good, right? So I, I didn't work out for those first few days. And in fact, we went to get tested uh, and I tested negative and he, Salad tested positive. And I reset my test for a few days later because I said, I, I know I have something. And a few days later I went back and I did indeed test positive. But by that time I was already feeling uh, better. About eight days after we tested the first time we went back and I tested negative again. So my whole course was seven to eight days, one day of feeling a little poorly and for the most part, I was good. So I felt a ton of relief that I'd gone through it and minimal impact. I would say I had every symptom, uh, but it was relatively mild. Uh, I could almost feel it flowing through my body. So it started in my sinuses and I had sinus issues for a couple of weeks, but I also have allergies. I had headache for two days. I had fever for two days, but my fever never went above 100.5. I lost my sense of taste and smell again for about two or three days. And then I uh, also had gastro issues for about two or three days. Um, but it's just kind of like, I, I could literally feel it flowing. You know, it's just kind, kind of, of like a sequence. Yeah, kind of like sequence, like trying to figure out where it was going to go next in, in, in my body. I don't think it, uh, the HIV had any influence on the course of our treatment. With the onset of COVID and people's concern about social distancing and washing your hands and staying six feet apart, et cetera, I think there was a heightened awareness on both of our parts about the importance of doing that as HIV positive men. No one knew what the impact of coronavirus would be. Would it be that it would trigger more HIV? Would we be more susceptible? Is having HIV something that the coronavirus would take advantage of in the body? Or is it that we are both on our daily regimen to suppress our HIV? So would the fact that we're taking this strong daily medication uh, help us uh, to resolve coronavirus more quickly or have mild symptoms? So. We didn't really know the answer to that, but I think emotionally we were keenly aware of the fact that we have HIV meant that we needed to be even more thoughtful and careful about not getting coronavirus. It's interesting to me to see the progress we made. I feel like the HIV community with ACT UP, with some of the activist groups who forced the FDA to be more thoughtful and be more speedy about drug development and about getting drugs to market and letting people test and experiment with them. I see amplifications of that with the COVID and the rush to the vaccine and the FDA saying, okay, let's, you know, Operation Warp Speed, let's get drugs to market quicker. I think gay men in our fight for HIV drugs and development uh, helped to create a different funnel for, for this in the FDA. And I feel like you see the amplification of that today in the process. So in that sense, I think because the country has gone through the HIV epidemic, we see a faster speed to market with COVID-19. On the other hand, I'm grateful that the nation has rallied as quickly and the world has rallied around helping to get vaccines for COVID-19 and, and coronavirus. But there, there was not that concern for HIV as gay men. Um, we were thought of as more disposable and that we, the world, it felt like the world didn't really care whether we got vaccine quickly. So I'm grateful that I feel like we laid a foundation for the world to get to a vaccine with coronavirus. I wish we'd have done the same thing. 30 years ago. On the parallels, um, what for me is kind of sad making is that uh, in, in both viruses, there's this idea that there are subgroups of the population that are expendable and that, well, you know, it is what it is. And it's that uh, continued unhealthy, um, if not sinful approach to exclusion. I'm uh, 
uh, like Tom of an age where, uh, you know, came of age with HIV. I'm a former Jesuit and I was a hospital chaplain. I was one of the first AIDS chaplains in the United States, actually. It was at the height of the virus, was a chaplain uh, for 10 years between 86 and 96. And so when your church itself was very hostile to the, even the work that I was doing in terms of taking care of those who were sick and dying, because in the years that I was a chaplain, every one of my patients died. And so those experiences, I think, are with Tom and I because we're of a certain age. And so I think there's a natural compassion that we have towards those who suffer. There's a part of me that I don't know why I continue to be shocked and dismayed at uh, the sociopolitical systems around us. I am shocked and dismayed at the lack of a coordinated federal response. And I do think that uh, I'm so grateful for the folks like Dr. Fauci, who was um, a big part of our own learning about HIV and is a big part of our own learnings around COVID. And having someone with that experience leading the charge, certainly more forcefully in 2021, actually gives me, gives me hope. But I think it would really raise a great question around how as a nation and as a society do we take a look at those who suffer from illness and suffer from various pandemics and viruses? Uh, we're going to have more. I always remind folks, you know, we, we've lost our sense of history. You know, in the 19th century, New Orleans had 22 outbreaks of yellow fever, and we don't seem to have learned from that. And then we have immigrant groups and folks who, you know, are the, uh, the essential workers who we called them essential, but then didn't give them any protections for, for, for dealing with what was essential. How that happened was I was talking to my um, uh, personal doctor, Dr. Lisa Sturman, and she uh, maintains close coordination with the um, uh, researchers at UCSF uh, and so was aware of this trial coming down uh, the pipe. Uh, funded by AMFAR and being led by UCSF. And the goal of uh, the research is to provide uh, its uh, study subjects with vaccine such that, and over the course of, I think, a series of five vaccinations, uh, such that these study participants could stop taking their daily HIV medication. And the body would then be in a position to manage the HIV on its own, right? The daily pill that we take every day can suppress HIV, but it just sits kind of, you know, uh, dormant, uh, if you will, in a reservoir waiting for you to stop taking that pill and then it sticks its head out and starts replicating again. So part of this vaccine is uh, to trick it to come out of its dormancy, stick its head out and be able to kill it uh, there as well to help your body in the ongoing fight to manage HIV by itself. So. Uh, as you pointed out, I've gone through one round of vaccinations. Um, I have a couple of more, I think, as I said, five in total. And I think in the uh, springtime is when, or end of March is when I go off my HIV meds. And then they monitor me weekly, uh, take my blood every week, and then we kind of see how my body does. Going back to the days of seeing uh, folks like um, uh, Magic Johnson and Elizabeth Taylor and attending some of those early fundraisers for, for, for AMFAR and being a part of watching AMFAR, you know, be born, uh, literally, uh, and grow. The dedication of, of folks who have been a part of, part of your organization for two generations now, um, I, I think is, uh, I just want to say that I am incredibly grateful for the work that y'all have done. Uh, for uh, the future. And I want to say thank you for that. And I think anything else that I would add on that, which is, uh, I think Sal and I both feel blessed and very lucky to be in a position that we, we got through COVID the way we did, that we live in a time where HIV is not a death sentence. And when you talked about my participating in uh, the trial, I mean, there was no question that I was going to, I think about all the gay men who died before they had access to any kind of medication or the trials that everybody went through just to get us to this point. So 
I stand on the shoulders of other people who've done this before and other people will stand on mine as we continue to make progress and that's the way it works, right? And so I feel like our gay community, the gay community has gone through a lot and I feel like we have a very uh, strong sense of resilience and fortitude and so I feel like we'll get through this as well and I'm, I'm happy to play my part.